you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, we have no uh, uh, pro proclamations or presentations. I uh, will ask the city clerk to explain the process in participating in tonight's open forum. Thank you, Mayor. The city council's agenda provides opportunities for the public to participate in the meeting by addressing the city council in the following ways. For non-agendized items, the public has the opportunity during open forum to address the city council on any item of interest that is within the city council's subject matter jurisdiction. For <coughs> The public can address the city council on each item of business it considers when the mayor opens public comment and should be focused on that particular item. Please note the speaker is not required to answer questions from the city council and the city council is not required to answer questions from the public. However, the mayor has the discretion to ask the staff to address the speaker's comments when a council member believes it is relevant to a particular business item. When participating in tonight's meeting, one comment may be given per person per item. For consent calendar items, one comment may be given for the entire consent calendar. If consent calendar items are pulled for discussion by the city council, a speaker will be allowed one comment for each pulled item and a separate comment for the remaining consent calendar. To provide comment, please fill out and turn in a speaker card found at the entrance of the council chambers. Speakers will be announced in the order received. Once public comment opens, each participant's name will be announced and the three minutes will begin once the lectern. The mayor will announce the conclusion of public comment period after comments have been voiced into the record. All right, very good. Do we have any uh, public comment tonight for open forum? Yes, sir, we do. The first speaker is Alan Marlin, followed by David McWiggin, followed by Marty Sutton. Mayor and there's no Speak loud. <laughs> Mayor and council members, if someone committed grand theft auto in California, the felon may face 16 months to three years of jail time and or a fine of $10,000. Now, I would expect the punishment to be proportionally greater the <coughs> and say stole hundreds of thousands of dollars belonging to the city of Livermore. Opponents to affordable housing downtown have purloined over a million from our local government, counting legal fees and staff time, fending off spurious lawsuits. The delay to Eaton Housing has caused us an additional 68 million of tax advantage financing credits. The perpetrators most responsible are Joan Settler, owner of The Independent, and Jean King, who together fund a variety of special interest groups, such as Move Eden Housing. If someone commits fraud in California, they may also be tried as a felon and face jail time or fines of many thousands of dollars. Fraud is defined as an intentional deception made for unfair personal gain or causing harm or loss to another person. As an example, Say Seppala and King organized a referendum designed to delay affordable housing and they lied to people, saying, claiming it wasn't to block affordable housing, no, not really, simply to move it to a place it could not be built. Or what if they knew the administrative approval of Eaton Housing wasn't subject to referendum but went ahead with it anyway? They would have then defrauded people of their time who believed them, who spent their weekends collecting signatures for the referendum. Seppel and King would certainly be causing harm to live more workers who are having their housing blocked. Our criminal justice system was designed to punish the poor, not the rich. The $10,000 fines for some of these crimes would be nothing to Seppel and King. Their special interest groups have already been forced to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in bonds for spurious lawsuits. Rather than being subject to the law, Seppel and King exploit to subjugate others. That said, because these two robber barons have funded another lawsuit to further delay affordable housing, 
I have called on District Attorney Pamela Price and Attorney General Rob Bonda to press charges. If you care about racial and housing justice, I urge you to do the same. Whether or not Joan Seppel and Jean King are guilty legally, they certainly are moral. The next speaker is David McWiggin, followed by Marty Sutton, followed by Greg Scott. Johnny, you seem to keep wanting to bring up my arrest. Well, one thing my arrest did was inform me of just how corrupt the Livermore Police Department is. Now, this level of corruption never happens, one, in isolation, and two, without political support. So I knew if I looked, I would finally find more corruption. And it didn't take long to find you help cover up rape. The arrest may, the arrest may have gotten the catalyst for looking, but the cover up is all you, Johnny. Well, let's clarify something. The complaint was for sleeping with someone under the influence. Influence. And no, Johnny, this was not a complaint by a woman that the officer had too much to drink to perform poorly in bed. No, this is a complaint from a woman who had too much to drink and passed out. I mean, the officer decided to use her, like a piece of meat, to satisfy himself anyway. This was not consensual sex. This was rape. Now, Mr. Callaway, I was believe, Johnny, that you have no real influence on the handling of complaints against police officers. Well, Johnny, didn't you make a motion in Officer Black's trial to suppress the use of complaints by the DA that you wanted to use them for evidence? And didn't that motion result in the complaints being excluded from evidence? Well, contrary to Mr. Alcala's legal opinion, most people understand that controlling whether complaints can be used as evidence in a trial has a very significant impact on the handling of those complaints. Now, you try to tell people in more than I'm lying. Well, Johnny, what's your definition of a cover-up? You made a successful motion in the court to block the use of the complaints in Officer Black's trial. It's clear that he had previously escaped culpability for those complaints because he was still in uniform and had the opportunity to sexually exploit a teenage girl. There was a chance for holding him to account for those complaints. That is why the DA wanted to introduce those complaints into evidence. Your specific action protected the officer from any potential consequences. Okay, Johnny. What do you call it when using your political position to interfere in a criminal trial blocking evidence the DA wanted to use to hold the man responsible? If not cover up, then what? Sorry, John, you're lying when you said you haven't helped cover up. You want crimes to by the more police. And you know, here's a little tidbit for other people. You probably didn't know. Captain Reynolds, the chief's new right-hand man, was only a senior patrol officer at the time when he came to release the scene of the accident. He was first in knowledge that the officer committed perjury, and now he's captain of patrol, right hand to the chief who covered up rape of a man who went out to sexually exploit a teenage girl. Clearly, the skills to get hit in Johnny Marchand's police force haven't changed. I told you, Johnny, you can line up against, against enough people, and eventually you're going to come across one who says, no, Johnny, not this time. You're a lying for a criminal, Johnny, and people are going to come to know you as Johnny the Rapist Marchand. Covered up rape. Um, I'd like to have a point of personal privilege. As someone who is a survivor of sexual assault and abuse, I really am struggling hearing someone else's, another young woman's story, being used in a battle that you have uh, with someone politically. I'm urging others who have disagreements with those on the dais to keep the disagreements about those on the dais. Whether or not there may be a story related to you are using someone else's pain to punish another person, and I'm really just not okay with, and I don't think the rest of the city is. So anyone else that's listening, I hope that you can behave better. The next speaker is Marty Sutton, followed by Greg Scott. Good evening. My name is Marty Sutton and I'm the board chair for Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance. Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance is celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year. We are a 501c3 organization with a mission to provide advocacy, collaboration, and education to strengthen the nonprofit organizations enriching our communities. Um, TVMPA has a very busy fall, so I'm here today to share some um, dates with you. First up, we have our community program this Thursday called Navigating New Horizons, Employment Law Updates for California Employers. This 
This program will equip nonprofit and community leaders with up-to-date knowledge and practical guidance on recent changes in employment law with our community member and attorney, Robert Nettleman. This is a free event this Thursday from 10.30 to noon at the Bankhead Theater. On September 24th, from 3.30 to 5.30, we are hosting Fund the People, elevating non profit success through talent investment. This is a continuation of our important conversation we started in May with the screening of Dan Pelota's documentary, Uncharitable. This will take place at Rosewood Commons in Pleasanton. Let's think differently about how we fund nonprofits and let's invest in our nonprofit workforce so we can retain and recruit the best of the best. Again, this event is September 24th from 3.30 to 5.30. On September 25th, we will host um, our Art and Wine Stroll at Common Point Nonprofit Center from 5 to 7 p.m. Come join us, sip wine, and enjoy artwork from our local artists. On October 24th, from 9 to 12.30, we are hosting a forum on mental health with Dr. T Tom Insel and Dr. Karen Dribble from the Alameda County Public Health. This will also take place at Rosewood Commons. Again, that's October 24th, from 9 to 12.30. It will be a forum on mental health. And lastly, we have our annual Power of Giving event on November 13th at 6.30 at the Bankhead. Our keynote speaker this year is Carrie Verrucchio from Workday. This is an uplifting event to celebrate our nonprofits. We will give out six awards to the nonprofit community. The award nominees have been nominated by the community and the winners have been voted on by prominent members of the community. All of these events, with the exception of the power of giving, are free to the public, and the power of giving we have a very small, minimal fee for to enter the bankhead. Everyone can register and learn more about Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance at tvnpa.org. Thank you. What time is the power of giving program? It begins at 6.30. 6.30. In November, what is it? November, uh, November 13th. 13th. I'll send this out to you guys, too. Thank you. The last speaker is Greg Scott. Good evening. I'm Greg Scott. I was homeless in Livermore, Livermore Sphere of Influence for six years, nine months, from October 1st, 19, um, 2015 to the late June of 2022. Uh, I attended the last Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance Anti-Poverty Coalition meeting. Uh, it was a panel of five or six. It was hosted by the City of Livermore. The MC was a uh, City of Livermore employee. There was no provision at that meeting for public comment. There was no provision for community vocal input at that meeting. There was no provision for my comment at that meeting, probably by design. How clever. I'm here speaking now. I've spoken to you. This will be seven years this month I've spoken on homeless to the city council. Not that there's much listening or reception with the city of Livermore staff or traction with the homeless industrial complex. I am blessed. I've been housed for 26 and a half months. Quite a blessing. I have a duty to communicate to the city of Livermore, my community, what I experienced, what I've gone through, and my impressions. I am so lucky not to be out there. It's only gotten worse out there in the 26 and a half months I have been housed in Livermore. What is the evidence of that? The evidence is the sweeping of the camps, the confiscation of the possessions of the homeless, the confiscation of the sleeping bags that were gifts and donated to them. It's only gotten worse. It's the same mode over and over. What has been the impetus for the sweeping of the camps? It's been U.S. Supreme Court decision, Grants Pass versus Johnson. It was passed uh, by the right-wing Supreme Court justices, uh, six of them in, in this last spring. It criminalized homelessness. <laughs> what would we do if Mary and Joseph were homeless today? Would we arrest them? put them in jail, that's what we do. We think that's the big solution. That's a pretty expensive solution. We know that doesn't work already. Another little observation for you, uh, Livermore, 
it's anecdotal, I know, but it's just I still have a number of connections into the homeless community. I'm not saying that, certainly not saying that all homeless are mentally ill. I know they're not. Uh, there's behavior problems, mental illness problems in the homeless community. But this is an observation, anecdotal. Maybe you want to take a survey. Maybe you could have city serve take a survey. Your percentage, your demographic in your homeless community in Livermore of mentally ill in that community is getting bigger. If anybody was really paying attention, they'd know that. Okay. It's the homeless games over and over and over. And what you do is you just keep throwing more and more money at it. It doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Question for staff. Uh, in the five shelters, five cities of the Tri Valley, uh, it's my recollection that there are probably four or possibly five uh, shelters for the disadvantaged, the homeless, and the ab abused. Uh, it's my recollection that all of those are in Livermore. Um, is, that, is that correct? Mr. Mayor, if one of these microphones will work. Um, yes, uh, that is our understanding as well. Right. So Goodness Village, um, the uh, uh, Vineyard Resource Center, uh, Tri-Valley, Haven, Shepherd's Gate. Uh, so all of those are in Livermore. And uh, um, we just heard a gentleman talk about the, uh, uh, the homeless in the, in the, uh, in the region of the Tri-Valley and this homeless camp sweeps. Um, what are the other cities doing? Uh, it seems to me that Livermore has stepped up more than just about anybody else in the region, and we have somebody saying that we're not doing enough. Maybe some of the other cities should step up and do more, because Livermore itself does not have the capacity or the resources to solve homelessness by itself. We're doing a tremendous job here, but we cannot do it alone, Mr. Scott. We need other cities, and we need the county and the state to step up. We're doing our share. But we can't do it all. No, 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 no. I, I, you had your chance. You had your chance. This is my opportunity to speak. You are saying that we're not doing enough. Others need to step up because we are doing a lot. Okay, thank you. I'm done with that. Moving on to the uh, consent calendar. Is there anything? Do we have, do we have any uh, public uh, uh, comment for the consent calendar? Yes, sir, we do. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Which items? Are these live now or not? I don't know. Um, okay, 5.1. Johnny, the rapist, Marchant, the mayor who covered up rape. Excuse me. I'm, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Alcala. Okay. He is, I am now being, this is slander. I am being accused of criminal activity, and that, I'm sorry, I'm not going to abide by that. This is not freedom of speech, this is slander. To put a point of order on this, the activity that Mr. McGuigan was making reference to at the, court, at the criminal court was not an action that was sanctioned by the, by the city council. That is an understanding between the police department and the city attorney's office in what's called a pitches motion. There's a special procedure to get into a certain amount of information. I'm not sure how Mr. McGuigan got his hands on it, um, but there is a rigid process about how you can obtain information. This mayor and the city council have no action whatsoever related to that particular activity. Um, that's within the uh, purview of the police department and the city attorney's office. Now, with regard to the particular comments being levied by Mr. McGuigan, he is treading into dangerous area. I do, he has been very careful about how he's chosen his words in the past, but now he has crossed the line and called the mayor a rapist directly. I would encourage you to choose your words carefully as you move forward and listen to the admonition by the mayor and focus your comments on the item under consideration. That was appropriate salutation. It was part of the comments. My comment so, is uh, he that it is my three minutes to talk, and your consent calendar has over $2.5 million worth of expenditures that people don't get to comment on because you're just glossing over them. 
2.5 million are just going to wash away, okay? People, at least for over 200,000, should have the opportunity to test any, any expenditure that's over 200,000, because it's their money. Now you can go ahead and discuss all you want, because you're still the guy who covered it up. I believe that anybody can speak on the consent calendar. Uh, Consent calendar items are typically routine in, no in nature, uh, and they are usually passed on a single motion because they are routine. However, anyone, anyone in the audience and anyone in the public can speak to any item on the consent calendar. Any one. Any one item. Any item on the consent calendar. I believe that's what I said. Okay, um, next. Greg Scott, consent calendar item um, is 5.1, I believe it is, on the Isabel housing. And I understand that the idea there is to put all the affordable housing into one building. Economic segregation is what it is. You know, I'm a baby boomer, and I grew up uh, with a big influence of World War II. And after World War II, the idea in America shaped by a war it was barely one, actually, uh, for every 10 Nazi soldiers killed on the Western Front, 12 American soldiers were killed. That wouldn't have been a, an effective long-term game of attrition. It was a very difficult war, but America was very shaped by that. My generation was very shaped by that. And what America did was try to be a more <coughs> egalitarian society, economically <coughs> and racially. And here we want uh, housing development. It's 2024, and we want to put, we want to economically segregate people into affordable housing. I just wonder if you've ever heard of social housing here where you put mixed incomes into, into a particular housing. Um, we have a big problem in this country that's tearing us apart, and that is the growing rift of social inequity and social inequality. In 1989, the top 10% average of the wealth of the top 10% was 15 times the wealth of a median wage earner. In 2020, that was 20 times. It's only growing worse. The inequity is a big part of our problems. The, the inequality is a big part of the problems. And what are we doing by segregating by economics in this, in this project? It, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, we're only accentuating problems, as we are in homelessness, too. And by the way, I, I witnessed in my time the oppression and the repression and the suppression of, of the Dublin Police Department and mayor was and now Supervisor Haggerty, and I witnessed the suppression and oppression, and they forced what Pleasanton did and the police did is force the homeless to go to Livermore. So you all and I were in an event where uh, the mayor Brown was present at that event, and it, you know, honestly, it's hard for me to stomach. Good evening, Council. I am well. I is it's a middle one. <laughs> well, I can probably talk loud enough anyway. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to speak about three different items on this. 5.2, which is the development code amendments, and in these changes, it is good that there are more of the lower affordable um, income units. For sale, you now have 15% of the affordable units are to low and moderate income households. I certainly endorse that. The rental units now 20% to very low, low, medium, and moderate income households. Households of all incomes need affordable housing, and I congratulate you about bringing this change. Inclusionary housing is needed where the affordable units are included with the market rate housing and built at the same time and includes all types of the units. I am very much in favor of inclusionary housing in Livermore. It has worked very well, I think. I was very disappointed when the inclusionary housing requirement was dropped from what the last Isabel development and the affordable housing was slumped together to possibly to be built at the future time and not 
when the market and not when the market rate housing is built. I hope that will not happen again. Substitution of in lieu fees for building units should be discouraged. Ensure that the in lieu fee is adequate to actually build a unit. 347,000 does not seem adequate in these times. Section C E dash E dash four seems to be allowing more in lieu fees and not requiring the construction of affordable units when the redevelopment project is built. And this doesn't seem better. Okay, on 5.8, the Arroyo Vista, I want to thank the staff member, Caitlin Harrison, for responding to my question about the 52 units of affordable housing in the townhomes and flats of this project, the Arroyo Vista and the in lieu fees for the remaining unbuilt 13.13 .13 units. I always want the full number of affordable units to be built and no substitution of in lieu fees, but make sure the in lieu fees are adequate in these times. So, um, item number 5.14, the LHTF. It is really good to see progress made on the phase one 80 senior units and also the phase two senior units of affordable housing on Pacific Avenue. These have been in the works for six years on the city owned property. Getting funding, including the tax credit finance is very difficult, but hopefully getting this funding will help. That property has been available for the last six years and the city has approved it. They tried to move forward with it, as you know, but it is very hard to get funding for affordable housing. Thank you very much for the progress. Okay, um, I don't really want to pull anything for comment. I just want to make, I'm just going to make some comments on it. I'm not going to pull anything. I just have a, a few comments to make. Uh, 5.6. Um, where uh, this is about the uh, uh, the UV extending the contract for, uh, for the ultraviolet uh, uh, disinfection at the wastewater plant. Uh, the total cost of this project is over $36 million. Uh, and a lot of the cities would have to bond for a project of that size. Um, and I've taken some complaints over the, uh, over the years because people are saying, well, why are other cities' rates cheaper, or why are their connection fees cheaper? Why is Livermore higher? Well, there are other cities around us now that are having to go to bonds because they haven't kept up with the renewal and replacement uh, allowance that's required uh, for their infrastructure. Uh, in 2015, we implemented uh, an asset management plan. Uh, it was really quite revolutionary. And having come from the water industry, I understand that you have to have these funds set up to ensure that when the assets reach the end of their life, you have the money to, to replace those. Uh, I spent 15 years on the Zone 7 Water Board, and we were a pay-as-you-go go organization. Uh, it's easier and it's cheaper in the short term to go bonds, uh, but it's also, it doubles the cost of the project. Uh, so again, answering that question, 75% of these costs are funded by user fees. So we have appropriately set those fees so that when we needed that money, we've got that $36 million uh, to spend. So I, I, I applaud staff for doing a great job. It's not always easy because it, it looks easier when somebody else is, uh, is charging less, uh, and we have to justify that we're charging more. Uh, and, but this is why. Uh, and people forget this, that this is the cheaper way to go because in the long term it costs, you're not paying the bonding costs. So I applaud the staff for doing that. Question on 5.8. Um, first time I saw this project, I guess about six, seven years ago, uh, they had some really cool artwork that was proposed for it. Um, are they going to continue with the artwork? Are they going to in lieu it so that the, uh, the city uh, has oversight over those funds? Or what are they going to do with that? So uh, the original uh, proposal was conceptual, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, uh, at this point, the project is moving forward with Okay, because that was one thing. So I want art to be a part of every day's, every, everybody's everyday life, uh, that they can make it a part of their life. You know, the, uh, we've got the, the wonderful sculptures downtown. We have Tada by uh, uh, the Lizzie Fountain. We've got uh, 
uh, the, the pelagic birds uh, across from, from patches. Uh, so those are the fun things. And it, it's funny, with uh, Sage, at first they didn't want to do the public art because they thought it was going to be a, a, a liability. And now when you drive up by Sage, they have advertisements of their public art because they understand that this really is an asset for their community and it's, it's a marketing draw. So uh, uh, however we can incorporate art within that community, uh, yeah, if we've got the, the ability to do that, great. I'd love to have, you know, we can pick out the art so that it's within that community. So that's terrific, thank you. Um, 5.15 uh, shows the uh, police vehicles were about $73,000. Uh, again, this is an asset that runs its uh, course of its life. It's gotta be replaced. Um, I thought that was cheap. Uh, and I understand that, uh, what, is, what is the actual cost of a, uh, it comes in about $73,000. What's the actual cost of a, of a fire, of, of, of a police vehicle? Mr. Mayor, um, the full cost is close to 100000 per vehicle uh, once uh, additional features um, are included. Okay, you have, you have computers and you've got lights and sirens and racks and locks and all sorts of stuff. So, okay, so we're not getting a real deal uh, at 73 grand. It's closer to $100,000. And again, that's another case to make sure that we have those, those funds in place when we need to retire those assets. Um, and that's, uh, that's, oh, um, yeah, that's it for my notes. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, yes, Vice Mayor. Yeah, 514 caught my eye as well as uh, Ms. King mentioned it earlier again. Uh, the mayor and I were on city council back when we approved this project way back in 2018, and it, it has, it shows you how long it takes to, uh, to obtain the funding for uh, affordable housing. But I congratulate Saha and others for this uh, amount of money, and we hope that they get the uh, tax credit financing next so that they can get started on this. Uh, again, um, again, it takes a long time for projects to get going, particularly ones that require grants and other forms of uh, funding. But again, that caught my eye, so I thank you. Ms. King for noticing that as well. Congrats to, uh, to the city and others for obtaining that money. Thank you. Well, and, that, and that's part of the problem is that there's only twice a year where you can apply for those credits. And if you miss that window, you know, you're going into the next year. So it's, uh, uh, again, very creative uh, activities by the staff. And as we all understand, uh, if it's affordable housing, it requires significant subsidies. Uh, because a lot of projects, if you require the developer to put in all of the housing, uh, both ho low and uh, very low, it's not going to get built because they, uh, it's not going to pencil out, so they don't, uh, they don't build it because they, you know, they're not going to make any money on it. So uh, if they're not going to make any money, it's not going to get built, and then nobody gets housed. So these are all things that have to be taken into consider consideration. Uh, so with that, I'd like to have two motions for the uh, uh, consent calendar. Uh, one for 5.1, uh, that's for the uh, July 22nd minutes because uh, uh, Councilmember Kick was not here. So do I have a motion for 5.1? I'll move 5.1. Second. Uh, motion by uh, Councilmember Branning, seconded by Vice Mayor Carling. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Aye. Yeah. Abstain. Yes, abstain. Sorry. <laughs> I know, it's a reflex. <laughs> okay, um, do I have a motion for the balance of the consent calendar? So moved. Um, motion by, made by uh, Councilmember Barrientos. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Branning. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All in favor, seeing favor, saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? That passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to uh, um, public hearings. We have 6.1, hearing to consider uh, the protests related to the annual fire hazard abatement program. Uh, I noticed that uh, we had a really long list, uh, and all of a sudden that list got significantly weeded out. And we have uh, our uh, Deputy Chief Fire Marshal uh, Ryan Rucker uh, here. Good evening, Honorable Mayor.
Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. On March 11, 2024, the Council adopted Resolution 2024-30, declaring existing conditions of growing weeds, accumulated rubbish, uh, dirt on private property streets, parkways, and sidewalks adjacent to each parcel of real property are a public nuisance and should be abated. On April 15th, the Council ordered the abatement of hazardous vegetation on the parcels identified in Exhibit A of the attached resolution and declared that the abatement costs, including administrative costs inc incurred by the city, are the responsibility of the property owner. A schedule has been provided to all property owners, which include abatement timelines, uh, work scheduled work needed based on parcel type, as well as the administrative costs, which are charged when the city performs the abatement of 20, uh, 255 parcels inspected starting uh, June 1st. The fire department concluded hazardous vegetation abatement on one parcel in July at a total cost of $2,637, a compliance rate of over 99%. The public hearing tonight is to consider any and all protests, and if council finds it appropriate, adopt a resolution overruling protests, confirm the 2024 weed abatement assessments, and direct staff to forward a copy, certified copy of the assessment report to the county auditor. Staff's available for questions. Okay, any questions? No. Do we have any public comment tonight? No, sir, no oh. public comment has Okay, I'll open the public comment period and then close it, uh, since there's no public comment. Um, and then, uh, uh, any comments? Uh, do I have a motion? I move uh, staff recommendation. <coughs> second. Okay, motion made by uh, Vice Mayor Carling, seconded by Council Member Barry Antos. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any, uh, uh, any abstentions? Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, 6.2 this is a hearing to uh, consider a request for a specific plan amendment, uh, plan development, uh, site plan design modification uh, for the Arroyo Vista residential project. This is to increase the height from the single family uh, detached from two stories to three stories. Straight to the recommendation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Straight to the recommendation. Heck with the rest of the stuff, right? I saw a shadow puppet. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Tonight, I will be presenting the proposed Arroyo Vista residential project, which continues to implement the Arroyo Vista neighborhood plan. The subject site is 29 acres located southeast of Arroyo Vista and Las Positas Road. The site is bisected by the Arroyo Seco flood channel adjacent with existing commercial to the west and light industrial uses to the north, east, and south. The project site is located just east of the Safeway Shopping Center and First Street. To provide a brief background, the City Council adopted the Royal Vista Neighborhood Plan and certified its initial study mitigated negative declaration in July 2007. Following the adoption of the Neighborhood Plan, the City Council approved a project for 435 residential units proposed by Summer Hill Homes in July 2017 and certified an addendum to the initial study mitigated negative declaration. Trimark Homes purchased the property, acquired the entitlement, and applied for a modification in January 2024. The site boundaries are shown on red in the slide. The entitlements for this project include a specific plan amendment, plan development amendment, site plan design review modification, and development agreement amendment. This modified project focuses on the areas circled in red and includes amendments to increase the allowable height of the single family homes from two to three stories, 
remove the previous pedestrian bridge requirement, provide pocket parks in place of the pedestrian bridge landings, provide additional pedestrian connections, and provide a financial contribution. The 2017 approved project has not yet been constructed, but part of the site is currently being graded to allow construction of the residential buildings that are not subject to this amendment. The colored areas are the location of the project and the areas in gray are not within the scope. The proposal by Tremark Homes consists of allowing the approved 86 single family detached homes to be three stories instead of two, which is compatible with the surrounding three story residential multifamily products in the 2017 approval. All units would be for sale, which is unchanged from the 2017 approved project. Due to long term maintenance and cost complications between the city, Zone 7 and Future Homeowners Association, the city and developer agreed it would be better to remove the bridge requirement. As an alternate but equal public benefit, the developer would contribute $2 million to be split, split equally between the Community Benefit Fund and Social Opportunity Endowment Fund. Additionally, the modified project would also provide two pocket parks with trail amenities such as benches and pedestrian paths. The modified project applies with the neighborhood plan, zoning, minimum densities, development standards, and is otherwise consistent with the 2017 approval. As shown on this slide, the architectural styles approved in 2017 remain unchanged and include ranch, prairie, and craftsman. Key elements of these architectural styles include brick and stone wall accents, shutters, and defined patios. The color palette includes rich earth tones and natural colors that would blend well with the surrounding environment. The modified project provides landscaping that is complementary and consistent with the 2017 approval. On-site landscaping includes a mix of flowering ever evergreen trees, shrubs, and ground cover with both California native plants and pollinators. Two pocket parks are provided as shown on this slide, one on the west parcel and one on the east. The pocket parks provide outdoor barbecues, seating, and landscaping. On July 16, 2024, the Planning Commission unanimously rec recommended approval of the project subject to the following modified and additional conditions. The Commission made modifications to allow the Community Development Director to waive two conditions related to an additional pedestrian path connection and the installation of two benches along the trail if they, became, if they become infeasible. In addition, the Planning Commission added a new condition to enhance design elements for the unit, for the unit at the corner of Arroyo Vista and Las Positas Road. Staff supports this modified project and the amenities as shown on the slide, including the Community Benefit Fund, which finances projects such as, the community, as community events, business grants, and public spaces. Previously, the social endowment Social Opportunity Endowment Funds have been used for programs such as Maryland Avenue Food Pantry and Meals on Wheels in Livermore. Planning Commission and staff recommend the City Council take the following actions shown in the staff report and on this slide. Staff and the applicant are available for questions. The applicant would like to introduce them themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, my name is Michael Keeney, and I'm the Director of Forward Planning for Trumark Homes. Uh, I'd like to thank staff for their presentation and their efforts to move us through the process quickly and efficiently. And uh, just lastly, to say that our team is here, and we're available to answer any questions we have, and we think these revisions will improve the livability of the community for the benefit of uh, our buyers and your future homeowners. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, well, yes, Vice Mayor. So, uh, floor plan number one, as they identify as the first floor is ADU. So what are the restrictions? I mean, I know what they are for if you build a, an ADU in the backyard. Are the same restrictions going to be uh, imposed on that floor plan? So one of the members of our team that is here is Garrett Hines, our Vice President of uh, Architecture. And I'll let him uh, provide some details. Um, but I think he'll, what he's going to say and elaborate on is that the idea it, well, the, uh, the intent of it is just to be a, uh, a place for your, uh, someone in your family to live or your 
child that goes off to college and comes home and needs a place to live for a couple of years, it's, a, it's not necessarily an ADU. It's really, call it more of a next gen um, apartment that can be integrated into the house or not. It's flexible. Well, sure, I get that, but there are specific laws, state laws, uh -huh. on ADUs. Uh, their, their ADUs are over up to a certain over 750 square feet. If they're less than that, they're called junior ADUs, mm -hmm. and they have they have different requirements and not nearly as um, that I think you're afraid of. Will you have requirements that the buyers of this will they know and understand what those requirements are for these junior ADUs? Yes, yes, CCNRs and other uh, disclosures will be in place, and they will know. Okay, thank you. You bet. Yeah. Just to reiterate, they are, yeah, they are allowed to have junior ADUs, and, and they do still, uh, they are still subject to some of those same state laws. So we'll make sure to um, ensure they meet those as they move forward through the process. Okay, the plan just said ADU. It didn't say junior ADU. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, yes, we'll work with them because sometimes okay. it is a junior ADU, even though they don't call it that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to add on to that question to sort of clarify. When someone's buying this, they're not viewing this ADU as an investment opportunity. This is more a, a flexible, multi-generation living opportunity. That's the intent. That's okay. the intent. Is, uh, is someone allowed to use it as an investment opportunity with our ADU um, rules as they are now for like Airbnb? Is that something that we need to look into as a city to make sure that they are compliant with our Airbnb and our, or not Airbnb, our short-term rental uh, regulations. So this is Paul Spencer here, Assistant City Manager. So there are two ways that people could use an ADU. One is permanent rental, and that would be permitted in this mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other would be a short-term rental, and they would have to apply through the city's process and meet all of our requirements. That is a possibility, okay. but uh, they would have to meet that process. Yeah, but that would be an exception, right? Wouldn't that be an exception? I mean, today, if you build an ADU in your backyard, you cannot use that as a short-term rental. It has to be 30 days, right? Yes, I, yeah. actually, actually yeah. I, I think you are right. Mm -hmm. that, uh, these would then be limited uh, to long-term rentals. Correct. Yes, yes, my Okay, yes. so I just want to clarify what yeah. my colleague yeah, asked. Yeah. yeah, just because this is a, I mean, a, just in general, having flex multi-generational spaces, I think, are necessary. So I, I'm glad to see this. Um, but I think uh, being a new concept to, to some of the homes that are that are built here, it might cause some confusion. So the yes. clearer that we can be with staff and and potential buyers, um, the better. And then I have one other question, just about so uh, bridge, no bridge, because we're trying to make things um, uh, less. Uh, cumbersome down the road. We understand that everything requires maintenance, um, but it was also suggested that we add more benches. Benches don't have the same required maintenance as bridges, but it's still the, the concept of just adding more things to add things that we then have to take care of. Um, was there a specific reason why benches were discussed? Yeah, in this case, uh, you're along a regional trail along the, along the Arroyo Seco Channel. And so uh, consistent with some of our other regional trails, we do have you know stopping points and shade for people to rest. And uh, this was a good opportunity to get a bench or two along that stretch of the trail. So that's not unusual to have yeah. some benches. And they're relatively low maintenance. And this is uh, the ad additional things are at the discretion of the community development dir director, is that correct? Yeah, in this case, if for some reason it's not feasible to put a bench in this location because we're, we'll have to work closely with Zone 7 if there's some um, maintenance limitations based on how they maintain their channel, then we, you know, we'd have to look at that and not put a bench in. But at this point, it okay, appears perfect. like it should work okay. I just, I know that working with Zone 7 was an issue about the bridge. <laughs> it's not going to be an issue for other things. So good to know there's um, flexibility there. That's all my questions. Thank you. I have another question. About the, speaking about the bridge, I understand why it's removed, and I, I'm fine with that. I rode my bike by there the other day, and admittedly, there's a lot of construction going on. But there is a path along the street there, and I hope there's something you can do to, to maintain the appearance of that sidewalk between the phase one and phase two. You understand what I'm talking about? Along uh, the south, 
road, whatever that south road is, is that is that Las Positas there? Yeah, this Las is Positas. Las Positas. It's, it's uh, well, staff can comment too, but uh, we what we tried to do to ha there's some limitations on the, on the dimensions of that bridge. I understand. Um, but we're adding some wayfinding and connection points and kind of nodes on phase one and phase two right. to help people figure out how to get from one side of the project to the other if they want to use amenities from one side or the other side. Yeah, that's what I would hope. I mean, yeah. since without the bridge, they want to take advantage of both sides, maybe. And right now, I mean, it's. Uh, be a little threatening, I think, for anybody, so with little kids to walk from one to the other along that sidewalk between phase one and phase two. So but the sidewalk across the bridge is not too much to do, but we can help with wayfinding and connections and make it much more Fine. inviting. Okay, and cut down all the weeds. <laughs> They're, they're, a lot of them are gone because we're grading and grading infrastructure. So it's we'll the city's it's issue than yours. Much nicer when we're done. Good. Thank you, Councilmember Brandon. Uh, the vice mayor more or less took my comment, but I want to follow up on it. Um, it is actually not that easy to bike or walk on the south side of the project. Uh, so people coming from the east side—I think you call it the east side or phase one—people um, coming from the east side to try to get to Safeway, it's going to be difficult. Uh, not too bad, but the trail's not in great shape right now. Uh, so when we get to repaving along with the project, doing work there, can we make sure that we work on improvements to bike and pedestrian access to Safeway and the plaza? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? very slowly these days. Okay, guess what my question is about? Affordable housing. <laughs> okay, on the phase one, the way I understand it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there were 52 flats and townhouses that were going to be affordable. And so these are, these are, and these are for sale houses, detached. So are there going to be, a, have I missed it? Are there affordable ones for sale in this phase? That's the question I'm asking. For that staff? Um, so the answer is um, there's not in this phase for the single family. Um, the project originally was approved as a whole for all 435 units and the 52 units would be dispersed throughout the remaining parts of the project that has been approved. But, but are there, are there places to disperse them besides in the first project, besides in just with the townhouses and the flats? There aren't, are there going to be anything in the for sale? Um, not, I, the other products are also for sale as well. Sale. Um, but in the single family, there will not be, the, they have the option, the developer to do in lieu fees, and the developer has taken the option to pay in lieu fees for the single family. Oh. So how many units were, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to talk to them, am I? <laughs> I just wanted, uh, you know, because there were 52 that were going to be due on and the rest were going to be in lieu, but I didn't think that that would be the total because if there are, what, 400 and some odd units in the total project, that doesn't come out to be the right number. So I think that they're saying, but I would like to know how much is going to be in lieu as opposed to being built. Yeah. To provide even more background, um, so for the 435 units, it's about uh, 65.25 units were required. Um, so 52 will be built, and then to supp supplement the remaining amount, it will be in lieu fees. So the in lieu fees is not covering the requirement for all 435 units. It's just covering the difference between the 65.25 and the 52. Um, and then the rest will be supplemented with um, in lieu fees. And I think, let me try and translate here. You're yeah. asking that it, there will be none built in phase one, correct? 
So phase one will actually be the west parcel. Um, phase two is the east parcel. There are affordable units um, in both the west and east parcel. Okay. Um, but within this modification to the project, there are no affordable units because it's just a single family. So the west parcel will have single families, single family units in the northern portion of uh, phase one, and then there will be multifamily um, in the southern portion of phase one. So there will be affordable units, just not within this specific modification. I think it's confusing because this modification isn't actually an entire phase. It's a short period, it's a sh small piece. And so in this small little chunk, there are no affordable units being built. However, throughout the rest of the project, 52 will be dispersed. It just so happens that the tiny little portion we're discussing tonight does not have any of those 52 units. Correct? Okay. That's correct. Okay. So, so what is the total number? Including 52. the in the in lieu, okay, 52 are being 52 built. 52 are being built somewhere on that property. Okay. None of them on this small little piece. Okay. And the total required is 65.25. You can't make a 0.25 of a house. So nice. 50, nice. 62.25 minus 52 is some number that someone else who's faster at math can do. Right. Okay. Um, and that is the amount that's in lieu, 13. but 52 okay. total. Are being and built so what's throughout. the what's the total percentage of in of affordable that's coming out of the however who can, many there who can do including the percentage? The who's got the phone okay that's all right 65 out of 435 okay. uh, i I, th I think uh, you're doing it and i was just with, you know confused King, that they were all going to be in those other ones if i may um just so you know and i believe staff can correct me on this uh when this was passed it was a little bit easier in the city to use in Luffy's. Um, you'll be happy to know that since that time we have tightened up the rules quite a bit and if this project were being proposed today they wouldn't have the in lieu fees for those projects at the time they had the right to them uh, now it requires council approval for them so it would be fairly unlikely that you'd be here uh, so the rules have changed we've made it much much stricter much more stringent and require the full percentage basically of all projects other than the fractional percents. Okay. That, 65 is about good, and I hope the in lieu fees are enough to cover 65 homes is about 15 percent or thereabouts. Okay. Uh, right? Well, I and I think we well 10 percent is 43 <laughs> so. Okay <laughs> all right well thank you thank you very much for all this I yeah. appreciate it. Okay. Hi, um, I don't know if I understand this correctly. Um, the maps, are, I want to say I don't want any any housing at all approved in Midtown or up against Springtown until the general plan is sorted out and really critiqued and looked at as a whole. Um, I think our city and our city, our city staff and our city council um, have made it, have directed a focus area to be Midtown. And I think that's because there's a Valley Link that's approved like by Bosco and one that I think they're trying to, you know, get over um, near like um, Springtown, I think near like Lassen area. I think there's massing of housing and I think it does disproportionately um, enrich other districts. I would like to see at least it entertained that um, the general plan is looked at as a whole and that we divide our renal, RENA or whatever that is, housing yeah. allocation, <laughs> um, d divide it up equally, at least try, you know, because, you know, you can put mass transit and focus it in one area heavily, and, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna choke a lot of other people's roads, you're gonna choke a lot of other people's traffic, and I think it's only fair, you know, that you look at each area, show overlays to your public so that they can critique it. I mean, I did go to county meetings when they were talking about both value links, and it's like, why shouldn't people in other districts have mass transit as well? And then 
<laughs> build, yes, but don't build, um, don't mass areas, phase each area. You know, be fair about it. I think that, I don't think you're fair about it. I do agree with the speaker before me who said that some of the stuff on the consent calendar goes through. I would have loved to have commented on 5-8, but you know what, if there's more than one item on the consent calendar that you wanna talk about, you can't. And it's hard because on the website, your agenda too, it did accentuate the public hearing. Um, and I, while I knew there was a agenda buried underneath it all, unless I clicked the right link, which I should have been more led to, I would have had, I would have studied that a little bit more. So I'm asking you to, um, anything that you're gonna do extra anywhere, do it somewhere else for a while. You look at, at least look at the general plan as a whole before you focus in on that area. I know a lot of people that were on the um, commissions, the planning commissions, their interest was not where I lived, you know. And to your, I, I appreciate that you love art. I love art too. But tell you the piece of thing that art in Springtown, I don't see the beauty in it. My neighbors, a lot of them, like, what is that thing? So, you know, it, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, maybe people would, should have, and that was during the pandemic when that came, but maybe it would have been polite for our, our district to call a meeting and say, you know, we're gonna put this in Springtown, you know, let's have a meeting about it and let's, you know, communicate where we wanna go with this because, you know, you probably have good visions, but when you don't look at things as a whole, you block out other people's visions and I think that you could do better at being more inclusive and I think anybody in any district should have the right to get on mass transit and I know it's, I, I don't know how to solve the problem myself, but I don't think it's right that one area gets more over another on it. Thank you. Okay, and that question, I'm gonna close the public hearing on uh, uh, 6.2. Uh, with regards to the general plan, the, ge the general plan uh, is holistic. I mean, I actually worked on, this is the second one I worked on, uh, but that is a holistic view of the city. Uh, we have our reading numbers, which you know, we have to, we have to, to meet those requirements. Uh, so this next go around of, of arena is to see, or the next go around with the general plan, which is for the next 20 to 25 years, is uh, really to meet those future needs for, for residential, for commercial, for industrial. So it is a holistic view for the city. It's not, we don't look at it piecemeal, but we, we need to, to, we have goals that we must meet for the entire city. Um, Just and that's to be we, clear, what's on the agenda today has nothing to do with the general plan, correct? Right. Okay. True, true. Just, but <laughs> since it came up, yeah. we, we can't do, the, we don't do it piecemeal, is what I'm trying to say. We, we do a holistic vision. Uh, and as far as, uh, everybody getting mass transit, I mean, mass transit is where it comes in. Uh, you know, we can't split all of that out. That's, uh, uh, that's why it's mass transit. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, no further public comment. Uh, close that, uh, bring it back to the council. Any questions or comments from the council? Uh, with that, do we have a motion? Yeah, I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Carling uh, makes the motion. Uh, seconded by Council Member Kick. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Passed unanimously. Um, moving on to 7.1, matters for uh, consideration. Uh, designation of voting delegate uh, alternates for the 2024 League of California Cities General Assembly. So who's gonna be going to that? I believe you and uh, uh, Vice Mayor Carling. Uh, and Ben. Oh, you're ben, are you going? To Santa Barbara? No, it's uh, Long Beach. Oh no. Are you not going? Okay. okay. So it's uh, it's you and uh, uh, okay. This is your your first go around for the uh, for the the League of Voting Delegate. I'll make uh, it. I'll make I'll make it easy. I'm not gonna. I I, I got to get a flight home, so I, I'm gonna miss. Okay. The lunch in time and the right. vote. Well, yeah, in that case, I think I was uh, the alternate last time, so I would suggest that uh, uh, the council appoint. Uh, Councilmember Branning as the uh, voting delegate. 
Okay. Second, I believe we have to do, do the yes. whole. I'll sure. nominate Council Member Branding as I'll the vote. Second. I made the motion. Oh, you can sorry. So I'll second. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, okay. It's moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Just for formality, we don't have any public comment. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Very good. Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, should we also uh, make a motion to make uh, Vice Mayor Carling the alternate, just in case? Uh, if he's not going to be there. Well, uh, I'm leaving. <laughs> I think we have to. Don't we have to have one? So we, for, you'll do it. For emer emergency sakes, just okay. in case. Okay. For emergency sake, no. uh, okay, love Vice Mayor Carling to be the alternate. Uh, I'll okay. make that motion. I'll second. Okay. Seconded by Branding. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passed unanimously. Excellent. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, with that, uh, item 8.0, this is uh, committee reports and matters initiated. Councilmember Member Brenning. Uh, I don't have any matters initiated today. Uh, it's been a long time, it feels like, since we had our last council meeting. So quite a few activities through that time. Uh, I think the big one that everyone probably wants to highlight is Community Service Day. It was, of course, once again, amazing. Uh, the city always does an incredible job with that, uh, especially for one that was moved kind of last moment. And then uh, we lucked out. It was warm, but it wasn't too unreasonably warm. Uh, so I want to thank staff and everyone for putting that together. Uh, it was an awesome event. Uh, aside from that, I started a new job. So I've been quite busy with that over the last month, and it's been very educational and informative. So I'm enjoying that quite a lot. So that's all I've got for me. All right, very good. Councilmember Kick. Uh, I just wanted to highlight Community Service Day. So Junction put in a garden, and originally we had uh, Junction K-8 school. It's where my children attend. Uh, wanted to put in a garden, and for the first Community Service Day, we decided to do it anyways, even though it was pouring rain. So phase one of our garden did go in with parent volunteers while it was very rainy. It was easier to dig. Uh, it sure was. Uh, and then we got to do phase two this time. So it was nice to see um, a lot of progress. We thought we'd maybe get phase one done by the end of the year, and now we have phase two done um, by the end of the year. So um, thank you for, for all the work to put that together. and. It was, it was cool to see the community show up, even though it wasn't official uh, last time. Um, and the, uh, the official help came ready and installed fencing and did all sorts of fun stuff. So um, thank you to everyone who came out to that. That's all I have. All right. Councilor Barrientos. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I went out to the Marlin Park. <laughs> That anyway, where and we had a uh, dog, the dog park there, and you know, dogs like to dig, so they dumped two yards of dirt. And two young ladies came, and we three spread out the 200 yards under two yards of dirt. And I couldn't believe we did it, but my back felt like we did it the next day because we did have to move a lot. Of, uh, and one gentleman did come by, he helped for about half an hour. So we uh, covered all the dog holes. So you, if you have a doggy, it's all ready to go out there. Yeah. Come back out and dig. Yeah. Oh, the other thing is, uh, if you haven't been to the backyard to the side of the library, you should go check out the charger we have back there. It's so cool. It looks modern, very futuristic. It's the beam. And the beam. So that'd be one of the things that we're trying to get more, uh, you know, Cars charged, and I did have a meeting with the new CEO Ava, which used to be EBC, and he did ask me for what my my wants were, and I told him that uh, Mariana agreed to some of the things I I wanted that we need, and he's gonna we're gonna get together for a one on one. Personally, that one was on a, a Zoom, so he wants to come out. Well, I'm, I'm gonna meet with him over in uh, Fringtown later this month and I asked Marianne to come along if she wants so she's willing to uh, hopefully keep her fingers crossed we'll get our wish list oh, great excellent that's why we have people 
like you on those uh, those committees. Well done. Vice Mayor. So I had uh, quite a few things I wanted to mention, uh, if for no other reason than to show you sort of the breadth and the depth of what we do as a community. I, on the 1st of August, so this goes back, of course, since we haven't had any meetings since <coughs> July, it was the summer intern commencement. So uh, there, it was quite impressive to see the number of interns we had. It must have been 25 or 30-ish uh, interns. And a couple of them talked about what they had done during the their time here. And it was interesting to hear the projects they worked on. On the 3rd of August was Salute Soul at Manison Park, which we had TVMPA sponsors that. Marty's shaking her head. And again, I think there were a lot of people out there. It was a very, very nice day and um, good opportunity for those that uh, need that some of the resources that this community can offer to take advantage of them and, and hear about all the different activities that go uh, on within the nonprofit community here in, in town. On the 6th of August was National Night Out. I went out with Dave Martin, one of the officers in the police department. There are about 45 uh, community um, gatherings that evening. I didn't go to all 45, <laughs> but I went, Dave and I went to several. And uh, again, I, I think it shows the spirit of this community that so many people got together and brought uh, communities uh, in a time when they could talk and have the kids play and have a lot of fun. On the 21st, uh, Blessings of the Grapes at Three Steves. Again, another thing that this community <coughs> celebrates, and that's the wine industry. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, on the 29th, uh, Josh was, uh, Josh Thurman was kind enough to set up a, uh, a ride that I could join the uh, homeless liaison officers, uh, Paul and Robert. And uh, just, um, I want to let you know the kind of care that our officers have for people uh, that are fragile out there in the community. So we, and I'm going to say we because I was in the car, and it's just easier to say it that way. We were tasked uh, to find uh, a homeless individual um, and get them to city first city serve and then DMV so that they could get a California ID uh, because that's the first step in getting uh, permanent housing. This person is dealing with some medical issues, and so they, the Paul and Robert, uh, the HLOs, kind of suspected where this individual might be, and sure enough, they were behind Safeway, and we picked them up there, transferred them to CityServe. We picked up somebody at CityServe that was going to uh, be with this person through the process at DMV, and um, again, that's the first step in order to get permanent housing for this person was to get a California ID because they didn't have one. Um, we then visited with some of the other folks that are homeless in the community, but I just wanted to point out the kind of work that these people do on a daily basis, several days a week. Uh, to Mr. Barrientos's uh, point, uh, there is, I was at the EV charging ribbon cutting on the 30th. Um, we were the first community to deploy this EV charger in the country. And so the Department of Energy wanted to celebrate that. And so there are some officials, some managers from the uh, Department of Energy that came out, along with a bunch of, of their own interns, uh, to celebrate with us. Uh, Quest Science Center was key in making this happen. And um, they had some of their own high school students there to show uh, the folks from Washington what this community is all about and showed uh, them what uh, some of the students are working so on. And so again, I commend Quest and all the others for uh, making that a reality. And there's not just one of those uh, EV chargers, there's actually two. To Mr. Barrientos' point, there's one to the right of the library. Um, if you drive past where the book drop off, you, you'll see it. But there's also one behind City Hall. So uh, you could there are actually two of them on site. Another interesting thing that I, uh, we had a climate meeting on the 4th. Um, this is also very, I think, inspiring for this community. Uh, as you know, we put together a climate change document uh, a couple of years ago. We have a group of high school students that are, again, working with some of the leadership of Quest. 
to go around and collect temperature data in our community, to look for hot spots within our community. Because if they know where, if we know where the hot spots are within the community, we may be able to do something to mitigate some of those, like planting more trees. And so um, one of the leaders of that showed some of the data that they've collected. And again, it's, it's quite impressive. These students are driving around after dark. They wait for the turbulence to die down, the sun to go down, driving around after dark with these, um, with these monitors on the roof of their cars and uh, to collect all, they caught, collected 16,000 data points. So this is the kind of data that our high school students are collecting for us as a community and um, will help all of us understand what it is we can help in terms of mitigating climate change. Also went to a benefit for Open Heart Kitchen uh, on the 6th. Again, a great event. Um, I think they collected a lot of money. I was at the brilliance of the Bankhead last night, or no, Saturday night. Again, fabulous entertainment and uh, a great, great event. And I also partic participated in Community Service Day. I was out at Maryland Avenue School. Many of you know that's where my wife was a teacher for many years, so I spent my morning out at Maryland Avenue. Again, I just, I know it's rather long, but I wanted to alert people to the kind of community that we have, and I think we should all be proud of the uh, breadth and depth and diversity of activities. I do have one matter. So, if my colleagues agree, I'd like for the city staff to consider how the liaison meetings between Livermore and the cities of Pleasanton and Dublin and the Intergovernmental Committee could be reconfigured to allow them to be truly cooperative in nature. Because I don't think they're particularly, my own personal experiences, they're not very cooperative in nature at this point. For example, at least the one I serve on, which is the uh, liaison between Livermore and Pleasanton, there's no opportunity of us to vote on anything. So I, you know, I sort of wonder why we're even having these meetings. So my question or my suggestion is, is for staff to look at these meetings and see if there's a more effective way that these meetings, I think their meetings are important, but is there a more effective way that we can configure those meetings to take advantage of the folks that um, would be relevant for attending these meetings? You mean other than just a gripe session? Yeah, beyond just a gripe session. Uh, yeah. So. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. No meeting for the sake of meetings. Great. I couldn't agree more. Was that clear to the staff? Yes, Mr. Mayor, your direction is clear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. So remember, um, August, the, uh, the city council was, was, was dark in August. We took that off. Uh, and if you look at my uh, council report out, uh, I think I've got over 40 uh, events on here. Uh, uh, I can say that uh, for the vice, uh, vice mayor, uh, yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> we were just about everything together. Uh, it, was, uh, it was remarkable. The uh, Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance Salute Soul, what a great event that was. Uh, the National Night Out. Uh, I was at the uh, California Water Service had an emergency operations center uh, training activity. And uh, uh, one of the things that I learned early on in uh, emergency uh, service is that if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Uh, and uh, you've got to train to see who's uh, on point on all these things. Turns out finance is like one of the most important uh, organizations, one of the most important departments to, to have there because when you go back to FEMA, uh, there's all this requirement for, uh, uh, for verification. So if you've got all that in your finance department, uh, you still, then you can run a risk of getting, uh, or run the chance of getting uh, some of those funds back. Uh, Blessing the Grapes, again, uh, and it's sort of they started it out with, uh, because we had a representative from uh, uh, Temple Beth Emick, uh, and uh, the Catholic Church and uh, the Protestant Church. And so it started out with you know, a, a rabbi, a priest, uh, and a minister walking into a, into a vineyard. And they all agreed that it sort of sounded like a lead-in for a joke, but it wasn't because this, this was Livermore. Everybody's coming together to celebrate uh, this long-standing tradition for the longest uh, continuously operating wine region in the state of California. Uh, you know, we started in 1849. Um, we had uh, the retirement of Greg Park, who was a great asset for the city and for the police department. Uh, had the uh, annual Tri-Valley Mayor's Summit. Uh, that was a great event at 
uh, at Black Hawk, but it was an opportunity for the community to hear from all five mayors coming together about some of the problems that we share together and how do we find uh, similar solutions. Um, I was at an Eagle Scout Court of Honor for three upcoming Eagles. That was very exciting. Um, and uh, uh, the beam, the, also, so on uh, Sunday, yesterday, we had the 50th anniversary of the Holy Cross Lutheran School, uh, which was uh, a fun event. Uh, both of uh, my sons went to Holy Cross Lutheran, and my wife was a teacher there. Uh, but again, it shows that we have these wonderful resources in the community uh, that are supported by the community for, for generations. So uh, uh, we're out in the community and uh, uh, sharing some of the, the, the great news and the great activities that we're doing here. Um, I do have a, a matter initiated. Uh, the city council put the compensation for the council into the hands of the voters, uh, which means for the last probably 19 years, uh, the city council has no has had no uh, increase in the compensation, remuneration, or benefits uh, for the council. Uh, 19 years. So, uh, and you know, to be honest, we're not making much in, up here anyway. It barely covers, I think, the cost of the nonprofit event tickets that we buy. Uh, so maybe, and maybe it covers that. Uh, but perhaps I know, and we have we put that into the hands of the voters so there are local uh, restrictions and as well as state guidelines so if we just have it come back uh, in the next agenda uh, to be able to discuss where we go here I think the most we would be able to do would be a single cost of living for the most recent uh, period uh, we can't go retroactive so if the cost of living was you know 30 percent over the last 19 years we can't try to recapture any of that but let's just bring that back to uh, to have a conversation to see uh, where we go with that. Uh, do I have a few nods here? Okay, I got three nods. Uh, four, how? okay, got five. Okay, so we're good on that. Excellent. So we'll see that coming back. Um, so with that, uh, I will. Uh, we we lost a friend uh, last month, uh, a longtime servant of the city of Livermore, uh, former city manager Lee Horner passed away, uh, and Lee Horner was here when. Uh, uh, when I was uh, starting out, and uh, he was a great, uh, uh, a great resource and a, just a, a great human being. So uh, tonight I'm going to adjourn the meeting in honor and uh, memory of Lee Horner, our former city manager.